throughout the history of man, we find that many cultures have been identified by their architecture, whether it is Greek or Gothic or Art Deco. Many times architecture speaks of the heart and of the soul of a people. It speaks uh, of their history, it speaks of their passion, it speaks uh, of the direction of that people, and perhaps in some ways it, it defines them. And architecture can also have a profound effect on the lives of the people in that culture, influencing their perception of their nation, influencing their perception of themselves, influencing their emotions uh, and their, their dreams. But behind that architecture, there is an architect. And in planning and, and in designing a building, the architect must take into account uh, various factors for that building to stand, for it to endure over the course of time. And certainly an important factor to consider in designing a building are the materials that will be used to construct that building. And in today's environment, before that building is completed, it must uh, first meet certain standards of quality. It must be inspected and improved approved before it can be safely occupied. And in some ways, the Church of Jesus Christ is no different than that building. There are certain standards of quality, certain standards of truth that are required to be called the Church of Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, the Apostle Paul calls the fellowship of believers in the city of Corinth a building. He calls the people the building of God. God, God was the architect. He was the creator of that assembly of believers. He is the, the architect of all who gather in his name, who gather in truth. He is the one who designed that fellowship. He is the one who determined its specifications and uh, the conditions, even the uniqueness of the operation of that group of believers. He's the one who mandated what was important and what was acceptable in that church. After all, Jesus Christ is the one who gave his life to purchase those who are the true church. It's his church. And as Paul also points out in verse 5, we are just servants. We, we're just laborers in his church. All of us who know the Lord have an assignment. We all have a specific function in the body of Christ. And when we function in harmony, when we function in unity, when we function in the power of the Spirit of God, the truth will go out effectively and we will become a testimony to the world of the power of God, a testimony of his power to transform our lives. So beginning, in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul continues to construct this picture of a building to describe what the church is to be like, what the people who are in the church, who are part of that fellowship, are to be like, what we are to be like, how we're to function. So he says this in verse 10. I am what I am by the grace of God. 
If the Lord has used me to establish his church in Asia Minor and in Macedonia and in Greece, it is not because of me. I was a blasphemer, cursing the name of Christ. I was a relentless persecutor of his people, hunting them down and dragging them back to Jerusalem for punishment, violently mistreating them. But the Lord showed mercy to me. He brought me to himself. He saved me. And so all that I am, all that I have accomplished, he has accomplished in me and through me according to the grace of God which was given to me, haris in Greek, the gift of his favor towards me. God enabled Paul to do what needed to be done in the church. Paul labored according to the power of God that was at work within him as a wise sophos in Greek, as a skillful master builder, architectan in Greek, as a chief engineer, as a, as a general contractor. Paul followed the plan of God, who was the architect, the architect of our salvation. So Paul says, I, I carefully laid a foundation, the melios in Greek. I placed the foundation stones where they needed to be placed. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, it says in Psalm 118, verse 22, and in Acts 4.11. That is the stone that the builders of the nation of Israel rejected, but he is in fact the stone which all of the other stones in the building are aligned to. Everything we are, everything we do, is built upon Jesus Christ. And to oppose him is to oppose God. It is to oppose the plan of God. It is to reject his beloved son and the plan for our salvation. The true church is not built upon the tradition of men. It is not built upon a set of man-made practices and procedures and rituals. It's not even built upon a code of morality and of ethics. It is built upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ. And Paul adds uh, this thought in verse 10, and he says, another servant of Christ is building upon what has already been built. Building upon the work of Paul, who taught the foundational truth of faith in Christ. In Ephesus, it was Timothy who built upon the work of Paul. In, in Corinth, it was Apollos. But Paul warns us in verse 10, and he says, Let each man, let each individual in the church be careful, blepo in Greek, look and see and consider this, how you continue to build upon the foundation of Christ. It is the responsibility of all of us who know the Lord to be cautious, to be careful. There's no room for our personal opinions. There's no room for error. We must follow the blueprint. We must follow the plan of the architect, the plan of God. We must be sure that what we teach is in alignment with Christ and with his word. But we must also be careful to build upon that foundation day by day. How? How? Well, by our lives, by our words, by our actions, by our character, in our relationships with each other, in our service for Christ. We build upon that foundation by our very lives. 
And through our lives, we're always building something. The question is, what exactly are we building? And many people attempt to build another foundation, a foundation upon which they believe they will uh, build their lives. And sometimes it's a foundation of their own imagination. And sometimes it's a foundation of their own estimation. Sometimes it is a foundation of philosophy or even religion. But Paul emphatically makes it clear to us in verse 11 where he says, No man can lay a foundation other than the one which has already been laid, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds upon that foundation, he must be careful to build upon it with materials that are of the highest quality. With gold, and with silver, and with precious stones, timeos in Greek, with valuable stones like marble or granite. He must build upon it with the truth. He needs to build upon it with things that are in harmony, with things that are, are worthy of Jesus Christ. These are the things that are of great value. This is gold and silver and valuable stones. And we may think that we are building our lives with these materials, but someday we may find that we have been building our lives with, with wood, with wooden beams, and with hay that was mixed with mud to make bricks, and, and with straw, the, the stubble of the ground that was used for the roof. We gave the Lord just the bare minimum in our life. And we may find that our motives for serving the Lord were, were self-serving motives. We may find that our attitude was impure, that our conduct was not worthy of Him. And when we who belong to Christ appear before Him as we will appear before Him in glory, we will give an account to our Lord for our lives. Each man's work will become evident, it says in verse 13. Phanaros in Greek. It will become visible. Nothing will be hidden. For the day of final testing will show it. Deloo in Greek. The day when things will be made plain. Everything will be made clear. Because, it says, the truth will be revealed as if by the cleansing power of fire. And the fire itself will test our work, dokimatso in Greek. It will consume those things that are not worthy of Christ, and it will approve those things that are worthy of Him. They will remain forever then all will see the quality. Hopoios in Greek, the true value of his work. Then we'll see, then we'll see what really was gold and silver and valuable stones. And if any man's work with which he has built upon the foundation of Christ remains, Paul says, then he shall receive an eternal reward. But if any man's work is burned up, it says in verse 15, katakaio in Greek, burned down. If it goes up in smoke, well, he shall be ashamed because he has disgraced his Lord, and so he will suffer the loss of that eternal reward in heaven. But, Paul adds, he himself shall be saved from the wrath of God, yet so as if through fire. 
as if he is running through the flames, escaping with nothing except his eternal spirit. That's quite a picture, isn't it? What we did during our life as those who belong to Christ may have been useful. It may have been, been good, but it was not eternal. And in the end, only the Lord can truly determine the value of, of how we have lived our lives for him, how we've made the most of the opportunities that, that he gave us to serve him, how we use the resources that he entrusted to us. The bottom line is this. Our work should be his work. We belong to him, don't we? And so we should be totally committed to him. Something to think about, isn't it? Well, now Paul has told us about workmen who wisely built upon the foundation of Christ. He's also told us about workmen who unwisely built upon it. But now in verse 16 and in verse 17, he tells us about workmen who attempt to tear down the building, who attempt to destroy the work of Christ. These are destructive workmen, like weeds who are among the wheat in the church, the unsaved who are among the saved. And so he says, after all of this time, do you still not know that the community of believers in the church in the city of Corinth is sacred? Do you not know that you are a sacred community? You are a temple of God. Neos in Greek. You are a holy fellowship. And the Spirit of God dwells in you. And if any man attempts to destroy the temple of God, the people of God, the fellowship of God, the work of Christ, then it says God will destroy him. Pharaoh in Greek. He will tear him down. For the temple of God is holy. Hagios in Greek. Your fellowship has been set apart unto him. And God will guard and he will protect that which belongs to him. And that is who you are, Paul tells them. That is who we are. We are the holy ones of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So how should we react to these words? Well, told in 1 Corinthians 11.31 that we should judge ourselves rightly. We should discern who we are, what we're doing, and we should ask the Lord for forgiveness if what we're doing is not worthy of him. So that, it says, we are not judged and found lacking later on in eternity. Amen. listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Berean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.